Welcome to the third session in Cognitive Neuroscience in the Spring Semester 2021. Today we will cover imaging and brain lesions. First we will talk about physics and basic principles of MRI. Then we will talk about the bold signal which allows us to measure fMRI. Then we will be talking about fMRI data preprocessing and fMRI reverse inference and fMRI and connectivity. And eventually we will talk about brain lesion studies. If you recall last time we were talking about MEG and EEG which has a very high temporal resolution but a very bad spatial resolution. For fMRI it is right, um, quite the opposite. So here we have a high spatial resolution but a bad temporal resolution. fMRI is a recording method. It is non-invasive and uses the hemodynamic properties of the brain. The advantages of MRI are that it is non-invasive, so we don't use radiation as in PET, we don't use, we don't have to break skin as we would have to um, for um, single cell recordings for example. And as I said we have a very high spatial resolution which comes in handy if you want to for example image an individual gyrus. We can also differentiate between white and gray matter using MRI. We can measure changes in the blood oxygenation, which is then used for fMRI. And MRI data has a lot of information. It's very complex, um, very complex data, which can be very useful if you want to make, make complex analysis. Disadvantages of MRI are that we have a bad temporal resolution. It is only an indirect measure of brain activity, meaning we're not looking at, for example, the activity of single neurons or neuron ensembles, um, or even maybe the sum activation of postsynaptic potentials like with EEG. No, we don't look at that. Rather, what we do is we look at how the blood flow responds to the um, brain activity or differences in the brain activity. MRI is also very expensive compared to EEG, for example. And in MRI we have many degrees of freedom. Um, what I mean by that is that um, there's um, a complex way to analyze the MRI data and not all of these processing steps uh, are 100% um, standardized between labs, for example, between research groups. So there can be a difficulty of um, getting replications of certain studies. And um, it was also said that, um, like some people argue that fMRI can easily run into the problem of being some kind of high-tech version of phrenology, uh, meaning that um, researchers might sometimes be tempted to associate a specific brain region to um, a specific cognitive process even though that might not be justified by the data. Both structural and functional images are acquired using the same scanner. So here you can see an MRI scanner, and this is a schematic. Here, this is the magnet. Um, the, this electromagnet can uh, apply very strong magnetic field up to 10.5 Tesla, although 3 Tesla is um, probably the most common scanner for um, cognitive neuroscience research. Because we have such a strong magnet, there's also a, a severe danger of accidents. So here you can see a hospital band that doesn't even touch the ground because it is so strongly attracted by the, um, by the scanner. So it's very important to keep anything metal outside of the lab, like a cell phone, a wheelchair, or maybe some cleaning equipment. This is also true if you bring in patients or participants into an MRI lab. They need to get, um, they need to leave any metal items behind from uh, watches, jewelry, um, or um, for example uh, piercings, this kind of thing, pens that may contain metal. So um, yeah, this is very important to, to um, to be aware of the danger of magnets and to probably properly instruct all personnel and uh, any, any, any person that comes near the scanner. 
So let's talk a little bit about the physics and basic principles of MRI. So most human tissue is water-based and water, as you all know, consists of two H molecules and one oxygen molecule, so two hydrogen, one oxygen molecule. And the hydrogen molecule has a nucleus, which is a single proton. And single protons are like little dipoles. So they have a very weak magnetic field. And in a normal state, these fields are oriented randomly, which is why if you just um, if you were just to measure the magnetic field of water, you wouldn't find anything because on a large scale, um, there is no magnetic field um, induced by um, the hydrogen uh, nuclei here. Another thing to, you need to know about um, the, um, the protons, which is the hydrogen nucleus in H2O, uh, these protons can spin. So as you can see here, basically the orientation of the magnetic field is constantly changing by spinning, in, spinning around an imaginary circle, if you will. Now, if you have two protons, it can be that they spin in phase, as you can see here. So always oriented in the same direction. Or two protons can also be out of phase, as illustrated here. And this is um, something we can use in MRI, an MRI scanner. So imagine you have a person and a scanner and their hydrogen um, nuclei in the water molecules are randomly oriented. Now if we apply the magnetic field here, then what happens is that they're all aligned. So the magnetic field is so strong that the um, hydrogen nuclei are actually aligned with the, um, within, with the scanner, with the magnetic field of the scanner. Here you can see it is illustrated how um, eight um, protons are oriented into different directions. And even though they are not in phase, they all point rather to the top than any, any other direction, which means we have a net uh, longitudinal magnetization of the protons. Now the critical part in any MRI measurement is that we send an RF, a radio frequency pulse, to the scanner and this causes a disturbance in the proton alignment. Namely, some protons flip. This looks like this. In this example we have four protons that are now oriented into the opposite direction of what we had before. So the net longitudinal magnetization is now zero. Um, there's as many pointing upwards as downwards. So um, no magnetization left in that direction. This, that's the first thing that happens if we apply an RF pulse. The second thing is that now the protons spin in phase. And this means that we have a net magnetization vector that is turned towards the transverse plane. So the green arrow here indicates how strong the magnetic field is. So because they spin in phase, there will always be um, a transverse magnetization that is, um, it is uh, perpendicular to the original magnetization, 90 degrees. Huh? Now this RF pulse is only briefly applied to the scanner and when the RF pulse stops, there's two things that will happen. The first thing that will happen, or one thing that will happen, is that the protons flip back. So you can see now one has flipped back and we see some small longitudinal magnetization already. Another one flips back, the longitudinal magnetization gets bigger again. So this is what we call the longitudinal relaxation and so on. And once the protons are all oriented as they were before, we come back to the maximum longitudinal magnetization. And this is something we can measure. So the scanner receives the energy that is set free when this happens, when they spin back, 
and you can see in this graph across um, time how for water in this case the longitudinal magnetization goes back to the original level asymptoting there. Interestingly this function is different for different materials so for fat tissue for example it has a different um, a different uh, longitudinal relaxation function and this means we can differentiate between water and fat tissue. The second thing that happens after the RF pulse has stopped is, and this is what we um, measure with the T2 signal, it's the spin-spin relaxation, meaning that now the protons do not spin in phase anymore. So you can see they're dephasing and that means that the transverse magnetization is slowly decreasing. Now when they're all completely defaced then we have no net magnetization left um, so the transverse magnetization, magnetization is zero now. And inhomogeneities in the magnetic field can make the dephasing faster. So here again this is a function of how the signal changes across time um, and you can see for homogeneous materials it's um, it, it looks like this and for heterogeneous materials it looks like this so it's a bit faster. So what we do in the scanner is of course we measure uh, many times to get different slices of the body or if we're doing fMRI and if we're interested in cognitive functions we focus on the head of course um, but the MRI can also be applied to any other um, uh, part of your body for example if you have a knee injury and want to have a look at um, how the knee looks on the inside you can use MRI as well um, here you can see how the RF pulse is applied to different parts of the brain and then how we get different slices here. The basic principle of fMRI or MRI is that after the RF pulse is removed, the protons release energy which can then be detected as two signals, as T1 or as T2. This is the T1 weighted MRI and this is the T2 weighted MRI. This is CT as a comparison. So T1 is good to measure structural differences, for example the brain um, the structure, like where do you see white matter and gray matter. This is also what you would use of course um, if you want to get an image of, of the knee. Um, we can see differences between white and gray matter because the um, fat or water content in these two mat um, matters are uh, different. Um, okay, and the T2 signal is the is is great for measuring dynamic changes because the homogeneity of the tissue changes with time with um, different. Yeah, with time and with different activity levels of the brain because the oxygenation changes. We will look at that um, in the next part of today's lecture. So, um, to summarize, when a person, a brain is under the influence of a magnetic field, the hydrogen protons in the tissue will align with the magnetic field. And then we apply an RF pulse it changes the net magnetization vector by 90 degrees. Now, so this is, um, this is shown here. The longitudinal magnetization is gone. The transverse magnetization is relatively strong because the protons now spin in phase. And then after the pulse is removed, we get the T1 signal, which is the um, protons spinning back into the original um, into their original position and we get the T2 signal which is the um, protons not spinning in phase anymore. So this is an increasing signal with time and this is a decreasing signal with time.
Okay, so much about the physics and basic, princip physics and basic principles of MRI. In the next section, we will look at fMRI more specifically and uh, talk about the bold signal which allows us to measure fMRI.